Good morning once again. Hey, let's thank the band, man. We appreciate all they do for us here. I'm running a little behind. I didn't get everything done, so sorry. I'm going to ask a question this morning that might make some of you uncomfortable. And it's not my intent to make anyone uncomfortable. So your answer to the question should be between you and the Lord, not me and you or your neighbor or your, your spouse. It's between you and the Lord. And the question is right direct to the point. Are you sure of your salvation? Are you sure when you leave this world where you're going? Without a doubt. Now, if you're sitting there saying, hey, I'm kind of sure, or maybe I'm sure that you're saved, and going to heaven. But if you have any doubt at all, you're not where you need to be. Because when you leave this world, you have two options. Heaven or hell. There's no in-between. There's no go wait halfway through there. You know, you're not going to be in a holding pen. You're going one way or the other immediately. And we all should be sure what's in store for us after our time is up here on earth. Be sure. Because I visit with so many people that you ask them, are you saved? Well, I think I am. I know I did this. I know I did that. You know, I, I know I go to church all the time. You know, I attend church. I'm a good person. You should be sure. 100% sure of your salvation. We all should be sure what's in store for us after our time on earth is up. We should be 100% sure what's in store. And if you're not sure, then don't feel bad. Because there are folks that have been going to church their entire lives that aren't sure of their salvation. You say, how can that be? Well, they, they question themselves all the time. And Satan's real good at putting doubt in your head, right? So that happens, and that happens to the best Christians, the most devout Christians. So it can happen to anyone, but we don't want any gray area there. It's either black or white. You either have been saved or you're not. And some of these people feel that they are saved, but there seems to be a certain amount of doubt in their mind sometimes. Like they, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, I keep hearing that, I'm pretty sure. Man, I don't want to be pretty sure. You know, we always say, hey, you might get in. You might be smelling a little like smoke, but you're going to get in, right? So we got to be 100% sure of our salvation. I can say this with confidence. There should be no doubt. No doubt in your mind whether you're saved or not. No doubt this morning at all. Some people even believe that they're going to get in heaven based on their spouse's faith. Or their family's faith. That they're going to ride in on the coattail of them. I'm going to tell you. Yeah, the fact is that will not happen. That's pretty clear. Your salvation is based on your faith and your belief. Not someone else's. So don't think you're getting a free ride in. It's all up to you. Listen to these words spoken by Jesus in the book of John. John chapter 14 verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. This is the important part. No one, doesn't say some, it says no one comes to the Father except through me. Right? So that's based on your own relationship with the Lord, not somebody else's. And gaining your salvation comes down to three things that make it as easy as saying your ABCs. Three simple things. A, accept God as your Lord and Savior. B, believe he sent his son to die on the cross to cover our shortcomings and sins in our lives. And C, we commit our life to him. Three simple steps to find salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you join me there. Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. I don't think we can get any clearer than that. Amen. Some people think that salvation is just a single point in time. Okay, I got saved. That's it. It's true that that moment you trusted Jesus, a person permanently becomes a member of God's family. The minute you accept Jesus, that's true. But it's not that single point. It doesn't just end right there. There's more to do. Now, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be floating around on a cloud playing a harp. It's not going to happen. Don't go there. She said there's not going to be no fishing. Well, I look at it this way. Jesus made me a fisherman here. He'll make me a fisherman there. Amen. I'm not going to worry about that part of it, right? But he's got a job for us all. He's got some work for us to do. Anybody got any duct tape? We'll fix that problem. <laughs> Limiting the definition to that single faith decision, if you just limit it to that, it's not the complete picture. It's not just about the salvation that it stops right there. That's not the complete picture at all. Our, sal our salvation includes three parts that we should be aware of. Number one is justification which is the moment our sins are forgiven. You're justified. Right there. Justification is number one. Number two, sanctification, which is the process of becoming increasingly religious in our life or more righteous in our life, more like Jesus. Right? That's how, what, how sanctification works. And number three is glorification, which is the completion of the process when we're made perfectly sinless at the resurrection, when we go to heaven. Amen? So there are three processes there. that So it doesn't just take that. You've got to look at the three parts of salvation that we should look at as a whole instead of just one thing. It's hard to claim that we're saved if sanctification isn't happening in our lives. It's hard to do that because we should be striving and growing in Christ. We should be striving to be more like Christ. Our mindset should change. Now, when you're saved and, and you become a new person, because that's what happens, you're a new creation in Christ. When that happens, that doesn't mean that you're going to look different, but you are. Not physically, but you're going to look different to other people because they're going to see your heart. Your heart's going to change. Your mindset's going to change. So you start to think like Jesus. You start to look at things like Christ and doing the right thing. Always trying to make the right decisions. Do we always make the right decisions? No. Are we going to continue to fall down? Sure, the Bible tells us. We're going to stumble. Things are going to happen. But are we striving to get better? Are we striving to do better? Are we striving to be a better person in our life? That helps. That shows that sanctification is taking steps to get you there. And I believe more so than any that that's probably one of the most important parts it's to start to grow and see things different. But I know this. It changes the way you look at life. It makes life a lot better. Because like I said before, you don't look at life at the glass half empty. You look at it half full. Well, Christ helps with that. And there are Christians that attend church regularly and even serve in the church. But they still show to have a little, little limp in their walk with the Lord, right? little limp. I think of Michael Jr., the comedian, Christian comedian, says, the shoes don't match the hat, right? Right? They talk to talk, but they don't walk to walk, right? So they, they, they've got a little limp in there. So that's how sanctification works. We've got to get rid of the limp. We've got to get where we're walking straight and strong and standing tall for the Lord. And that's what he wants from us. The good news is, that God has promised to complete the good work he began in our lives. Rather, it started with our salvation the minute we're saved, but it doesn't end there because God's going to continue to work in our lives. And the reason some people have a little trouble with that walk with the Lord is because of the degree of godliness and fruitfulness varies with each individual. 
Everybody's not alike. God didn't make us all alike. Everybody's walk is different. Everybody's relationship with the Lord is different. I don't care if your relationship with the Lord is different as long as you've got a relationship with the Lord, right? That's what's important in our lives. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. This is part of the Apostle Paul's writings to the people in Philippi that uh, he was trying once again to make sure that they knew exactly where they were, where they were going, and how much he cared for them, how much he wanted them to further their walk with the Lord. So in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I like the part where it says, if God leads you to it, he's going to lead you through it. Okay? So if, if you come to Christ and you've been saved, it's not going to end there. God's going to keep, keep working on you. He's going to keep, keep developing you. He's going to keep where you're getting stronger in your walk and your relationship with him. But it's all up to you. You can either end it right there or you can carry it to the full. But you're not going to get away from him. God says, I got you in my hand. I ain't nobody, nobody going to snatch you out of my hand. So he's going to stay after you. But Paul was a confident man. You got to remember that before, before he uh, got blinded on the road to Damascus. Paul was a confident man before his salvation, before he had any of that. His self, he had a self-assured attitude. He thought he had it all going on. He was trusting in his credentials, who he was, his background, his education, and his position. He wasn't trusting in the Lord before he came to Christ. He, he was actually thought he had it all going on. That, that because of all that he had and possessed, that he was somebody. So he didn't mind going out persecuting all the Christians until Jesus says, that's enough. Right? That's enough. I'm going to put a stop to that. So he struck him down and blinded him on the road to Damascus, and he got Paul's attention. So are we trusting in our abilities alone? Are we trusting in who we are and our status or what we have or, you know, maybe our education or whatever? Are we trusting in that? Or are we trusting in the Lord? Because if you have all that, remember the Lord gave it to you. And the best thing to remember is the Lord can take it away from you. When he had his encounter with the Lord, that led Paul to realize that these things that he thought were so important were really not worth a whole lot. Rather, that wasn't important stuff anymore. So God changed his mind, but he changed his heart through salvation. And Paul's relationship with Jesus formed a new foundation. For his very existence that went on from there forward. He became a powerful force for the Lord. From that point on. He not only recognized the inadequacy of everything he had previously relied on. Like all this stuff was important. Like his knowledge, his achievement, his authority. He came to realize that living independently of the Lord was no longer a thought to be in his life at all. Rather, that thought's the furthest thing away from me now that it can be because I know without a doubt I need God in my, in my life. No longer am I doing it on. His confidence was not in itself anymore like we do. You know, sometimes our confidence is all built up in ourselves, but Paul's wasn't in him anymore. But in God's presence, his provision and his power that made him strong. Remember the Bible says, I can do all things. I can do all things through, that, through he who gives me strength. I can do all things, right? So Paul knew all at once. Paul knew that no longer his ability really didn't mean anything. But we run around here sometimes like our ability will get her done, right? We got it all going on. Well, 
if you're feeling that way and you're going on like that, be prepared. You can get knocked to your knees pretty quick. Hey, I'm a witness to that. I guarantee you. I thought that way. God got my attention and he'll get yours. I'm not just alone in that. But just like Paul, we can also be confident followers of Jesus Christ. We can be confident that following Jesus Christ is the right thing. It isn't who we are, what we believe about ourselves, or what strengths and abilities we have that matters. None of that matters. I guess it helps some, but it's not what matters most. Developing a wholehearted faith, belief, and trust in the reliance of Jesus Christ is what brings about our confidence that we have salvation. You want to believe you have salvation? Then lean on the Lord. Let his wonders open your eyes. As Christians, we know our Father wants us to follow his commands and instructions. So it doesn't just stop with salvation. We have commandments. We have instructions from the Lord all through the Bible. Some people go, oh, them commandments. And them were written a long time ago. They don't apply now. And you know, somebody told me, you know there are 10 of them? <laughs> yeah, there's 10 of them. And some people get four or five of them pretty close, right? But there's 10 of them. So it takes some work. The problem is that way too often, even when we try to obey what the Lord has for us, our old flesh just keeps getting in the way. Our old self gets right in the way all the time. Sometimes this is because of ignorance. We might not realize that a certain lifestyle isn't meant to be the norm of believers. We may not realize that. There's not one of us here today that couldn't use a lifestyle change of some kind. Somewhere in our life, there's something we could change to make our lives better. Maybe there's something that we are unwilling to, sur to surrender to God. You got anything you're carrying in your pocket this morning saying, hey, I'm the only one who knows about this? <laughs> yeah, that's not true. <laughs> God knows it's there, right? We're not ready to surrender that. We're not ready to give up that little bitty piece of our old self. You know, it's kind of like sin. What is they say? You like to rub up against it. You know, just rub up against that sin a little bit. I'm not sinning, but I'm getting close, right? Or I'm not ready to let go of that thing in my life to follow Christ. I'm not all in. That's a better way to put it. I'm not all in yet. That's when you limp. You got that little limp and you walk. It's when you're not ready to give it all up. <laughs> I don't know who that was. You know, sometimes it's hard to give up a desire, a habit, or a source of security that we need to give up, that we need to find a different way of handling that type of stuff. Another possibility, and this is a big one, another possibility is we have a sense of God's calling on our lives, but we're, we're running away from him in fear or even in rebellion. Remember Jonah? He rebelled. He ran away. That didn't work out very good. That didn't work out good at all. I think that little vacation he took in the belly of that fish wasn't the most comfortable thing in the world, right? So he rebelled, and he thought he was going to run away. So sometimes maybe that's what it is. God's calling us to do something in our lives to further our walk and draw us closer to him. He's, he's calling us, but we're going, wait, wait, no, no, no. Can't go there. We're trying to run away. In 1981, a Minnesota radio station reported a story about a stolen car in California. Police were staging an intense search for the vehicle and the driver, even to the point of placing announcements on local radio stations to contact the thief. On the front seat of the stolen car sat a box of crackers that, unknown to the thief, were laced with poison. The car owner had intended to use the crackers as rat bait, now the police and the owner of the Volkswagen Bug were more interested in apprehending the thief to save his life than to recover the car. So often, 
We run from God. We feel it is to escape his punishment in our lives. But what we're actually doing is avoiding his rescue. Good example. Why run? You can't run. I get you can run, but you can't hide. Right? God's going to find you. And he's going to keep after you. Because that's why the Bible tells us God, he doesn't want anyone left behind. And you know, if you find yourself described here today, take courage. You don't have to remain in that condition where you're uncertain of your salvation. You don't have to remain there. It's your choice. God gives us a choice. Letting go, man, that can be really difficult. Letting go of things. But when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the power of the Almighty God resides within you and it gives you that confidence and that strength to know no matter what, when I leave this earth, I'm going to be in heaven. And asking Jesus to come into your heart and receiving salvation can be a little scary. It can. It can be a little scary to people. But so is the alternative. Right? Talk about scary. My goodness. What is it they say? Heaven, yes, hell, no? Amen. Make a choice. Get real. Author Levi Lusky says it this way. The question is not whether you will live forever, but where. Well, that's good, right? Yeah, my wife gave me that. She's over there bragging. <laughs> that's good. Where are we going to live when we leave this earth? Choice is up to you. Our God is a God of grace and mercy, which means, once again, he wants no one left behind. Can he do it all by himself? Sure he could. But he wants you to help. He wants you to help. He wants you to get outside these walls and share your salvation and what it was like receiving salvation to others that may not know Jesus Christ. We got empty seats in here today. Well, they need to be full. And it takes you to fill them. How about this? Next week we're going to vote on our budget. We're voting on our elders. Next week... Why don't each and every one of you reach out and bring someone with you? One time. That's all it takes, one time. Because the majority of people that visit our church love what they see, they love the people, and they want to be part of it. But you got to introduce them, and you can't introduce them, and we can't minister to them if they don't get here, right? Reach out to somebody. Reach out to your neighbor. I remember a guy, a story about a guy that every time, every morning on Sunday mornings, he'd get up. And he'd go golfing every morning, every Sunday morning. His neighbor would get up and he'd go to church. And every Sunday morning he'd ask his neighbor to go golfing with him. He wouldn't. And he asked him one morning, he goes, well, where do you go on Sunday mornings? He goes, I go to church. He goes, well, I asked you to go golfing with me every Sunday, but you never asked me to go to church. Are we that way? Are we afraid to ask people to come to church? I know what it is. We need more food. <laughs> right? We need to serve on Sunday morning's food. We get everybody here. These Texans, they like to eat. These country folk like to eat. Amen. But there's more than that kind of food. There's fish. There you go. Food I'm talking about is the food that we receive from Jesus Christ. He wants to feed us the good stuff, right? Invite somebody. Bring someone to be you. Let's see if we can fill all these chairs up one time. You never know what's going to happen unless you ask. And sometimes your neighbor might just be sitting there waiting on you to ask. If we have faith in God's promises... And accept and believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We will not find ourselves in hell. We will not find ourselves there. But in heaven. With Jesus after our time ends here on earth. Right? Somebody goes, well, God, if he's all that great. If he's all that good. I don't see him sending me to hell. 
He don't grade on the curve. Right? He don't grade on the curve. It's straightforward. Don't count on that. To me, the most important promise of God is found in John 3, 16 and 17. If you go with me there, most of you know it. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then 17. Love this part. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Amen. That simple. Today, as you leave here, be confident in your salvation. And the reason I say today, be confident in your salvation. Back when I first started at Ellis County Cowboy Church, after a time there, I started the uh, Ellis County Cowboy Church Bass Club Ministry out of there. Our first tournament was coming up. We were getting ready for the very first tournament that we were going to have. Now, I'm a new Christian. I've been doing this about a year and found out when I started the bass deal, I, I would have to do prayer and a devotional. You'd think I wasn't shaking. In front of guys. God gave me the strength to do it. But one of the things that happened that first year, it wasn't the first term, but the second term that year, is uh, we had an individual that uh, went down to Lake Fairfield uh, to pre-fish, and he went by himself. And the wind was blowing about 40 miles an hour. And if you've never been to Fairfield, there are certain coves in there that has nothing but stumps in it. You're going to bump off one stump after another. And this gentleman, his family called me later that day and said, we can't find this individual. Something's happened. He hadn't come home. So they sent the rangers out to search for him. And they found his boat, but they ain't found him. And you're talking about a tough deal. So we had a bunch of uh, fishermen that gathered together, and we went down and did a, a day or two search, searching for this individual. They felt like he might have got out of his boat and uh, got out on the bank somewhere. So we searched all these woods and everywhere looking for this individual. Come to find out he had had a uh, hernia surgery about a week or so prior. So he wasn't in the best shape. He wasn't going to be able to walk or crawl through those woods very long. So we searched and we searched and... Uh, you know, they uh, finally went into his electronics because he had a GPS built into his electronics. And they saw where it was on one side of this cove. And then all at once, it changed directions and went completely across the cove where they found the boat. Saying that they think he fell out because they found his wallet and his car keys up on the deck of the boat right off the edge. So probably he fell in and put them up there on the boat, but with that wind blowing, the boat got away from him. And they found him about a week and a half later. He drowned. I'm going to tell you this. When he left that morning to go fishing, he didn't know he wasn't going home. He didn't have any idea that that was going to be his last day on this earth. He was a Christian. Thank God for that. But when you leave here today, if it's your time to leave this earth, are you going to heaven or are you going straight to hell? Your salvation depends on that. You could walk out of here today and that be the end of it. Don't put yourself in that position. A lot of people go, what if? How do you know all this? What, what makes you think that? Well, I'm not willing to take the chance for you. Because what hell's described it to, like in the Bible, I don't want a part of that. No part of that at all. And I don't believe any of us would. No, without a doubt, when you leave here this morning, that you are saved, and if anything happens, you're good. You're going to be in heaven with the Lord. Don't chance it. Get into God's Word as a way to stay confident that you're not just a fan, not just sitting in the cheap seats waving, not just a fan of Jesus, but you're a follower, that you stay close, and that your salvation is guaranteed because of your faith and your belief. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We lift this beautiful day to you, Father. We thank you for just all the blessings that you provide in our lives. Father, we thank you that uh, you saw fit to send your son to die on the cross to cover our sins, and our shortcomings in our lives. We're so thankful for that. 
Father, I know this sermon this morning that you put in my heart. There's someone here that's just a little bit aged, just a little bit uncomfortable, not sure. And if you're that person this morning, would you pray with me in this way? If you're ready to guarantee your place in heaven, would you pray with me in this way? You can pray out loud. You can pray silently. You pray however you'd like to pray. But pray it this way. Father God, come into my heart. Father, I want to be assured when I leave this earth that I'm in heaven with you. Father, today I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you sent your son to die on the cross for my sins and shortcomings in my life. And Father, today I commit my life to growing closer to you, following you, and growing to be like Jesus. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give all the glory to you. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Keep your heads bowed for just a minute, if you would. Nobody up looking around or any of that. If you said that prayer for the very first time this morning, we're not going to call you out, but would you raise your hand for us this morning and show us who's needing Christ in their life so maybe we could visit with you. Amen. Thank you, sir. You bet. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning.